This conference will now be recorded. Hello, this is Dr. Katherine Godwin. I'm the medical director of the adult program for eating disorders here at um, Laureate in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this conference. And um, I know we are all making adjustments and doing these things online, um, but I do hope that you'll find this format really um, positive and helpful. A lot of my slides have um, detail on that, and I've done that uh, intentionally to try to help the slides um, kind of stand on their own for reference at a, at a later point. Um, additionally, I want to point out that I've added my email address, and I am very um, welcoming of people reaching out to contact me, but like many of us, I avoid my phone. So if you want to email me, you're very welcome. And here we go. So um, we have three primary areas of discussion. First, we're gonna just briefly review the treatment targets for the common comorbidities um, to kind of talk about the relevance of this um, specific focus of concern. And then we'll talk about how malnutrition impacts the psychopharmacologic or the medication targets um, because malnutrition plays a significant role in impacting the benefit of medications for patients who are suffering with eating disorder behaviors. And finally, how being human impacts the treatment response um, in that there are some genetic um, tests available and there's a lot of kind of question about how do we use this, how do we apply it. In this scenario, it's really specific to um, psych psychiatric treatment as a whole because we still do not have psychiatric medications that are approved for the treatment of eating disorders but the vast majority of our patients with eating disorders also suffer other psychiatric concerns and treating those psychiatric concerns makes their overall treatment more successful. All right, um, about two thirds of patients who are diagnosed with an eating disorder are also diagnosed with either major depressive disorder or generalized anxiety disorder or both. In, uh, in some psychiatric circles, we talk about that it's rare to see a major depressive disorder that doesn't have an anxiety component. It's rare to see an anxiety disorder that doesn't have a depressive component. Um, however, in genetic testing, we don't see um, a standout for how you would diagnose one versus the other. And there's so much heterogeneity or um, different appearances of the genes of patients with these various disorders that we know um, at this point that we can't see it as the same illness and even one person's individual experience of depression or anxiety is so different than somebody else's. Um, so hopefully someday we'll be able to refine treatments further still, but this is where we are today. About half of that two thirds or a third of eating disorder patients will have experienced the onset of their depression or anxiety before the onset of their eating disorder. And the other half, therefore with or after the onset of their eating disorder. A reason why that could be very important is if the person never had depression or anxiety before they were in a malnourished state, that malnutrition may have played a significant role in the development of their depression or anxiety, which of course argues that treating the malnutrition will um, ideally play a significant role in returning to previous health. For the patients who experience their depression or anxiety before their eating disorder, the significance of that is that the depression or anxiety likely contributed to the development of their eating disorder, often uh, as some coping strategies in response to depression or anxiety. And uh, regardless, either way, you are seeing that depression and anxiety often um, will mingle with the eating disorder in ways where they both reinforce each other and that both need to be treated at the same time. Post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD is diagnosed anywhere from 30 to 60% of patients with eating disorders. And obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD diagnosed in 40% of our patients with eating disorders. Um, that number, I think most of us in the field would agree that it would be higher if you could include the patients who meet OCD criteria within or including their behaviors in their eating disorder. However, the OCD diagnosis is um, only permitted to be diagnosed along with an eating disorder if they meet full OCD criteria excluding eating disorder related behaviors. Um, in either case, the patients who have an obsessive compulsive patterned 
eating disorder um, often benefit similarly to how an OCD patient would benefit, and again, high comorbidity. In the treatment options for major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder, all of the uh, guidelines for the treatment of those disorders will have you start with either an SSRI or an SNRI. And uh, those are the subclasses of the antidepressant medications that are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. The first line treatment for OCD is SSRIs, with the second line being high dose SSRIs, and then um, augmentation with the atypical antipsychotics, medications like Cyprexor, Bilify, or Seroquel. Um, Oh, at this point, I'd like to say that I don't have any disclaimers. Uh, this is my, uh, my, my work is my only uh, practice, and so no conflicts of interest. I should have said that sooner. Um, I'll also take a second to mention that I often defer to the female pronoun, and that is because I work in a women's program. But uh, certainly, these discussions today would apply to um, somebody of any gender. All right, so SSRI and SNRI, what do they mean? Um, I just said that an SSRI is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but what that means is that by keeping your brain from taking serotonin back up from um, the, the junction between the two neurons, it allows the, the serotonin to act out there longer as though you had more serotonin in your brain, and so it increases serotonin availability throughout the brain. SNRI is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, so it does the same action at both transporters, increasing therefore serotonin and norepinephrine throughout the brain. Because norepinephrine is a chemical, uh, re has a chemical relationship to dopamine, and dopamine receptors are more present in the prefrontal cortex, anywhere where you have norepinephrine action, you are also having a potential for dopamine action. So an SNRI might be thought of as two and a half actions rather than two. As I go toward the research um, that is available about medications and their benefit within eating disorders care, I want to point out that there is a research bias. The effects of starvation and eating disorders is clearly not limited to anorexia nervosa. However, the vast majority of research is specific to the anorexia nervosa population, and there are lots of different reasons contributing to that. However, any eating disorder with a starvation component, be it restriction, restriction of specific food groups, um, as you might see like in an orthorexia, purging, relative nutrition uh, defi deficiency, excuse me, um, all these things can impact the availability of the neurochemical targets of our medications. And those conditions occur in anorexia, atypical anorexia, bulimia, orthorexia, purging disorders, and other uh, disordered eating. So while uh, the, the data is very specific to anorex anorexia nervosa, the component of the behavior which contributes uh, most to the lack of availability of neurochemicals as they need to be are common with numerous eating disorder conditions. And also I'll mention with failure to thrive, as you might see in um, poverty populations, in uh, geriatric populations, in chronically ill populations, they might have these same uh, relative nutrient deficiencies. All right, so antidepressants. Um, antidepressants is a misnomer. Um, somebody put, would probably prefer calling an antidepressant by its SSRI or SNRI or partial dopamine agonist or, or whatever um, could describe their action better, but antidepressants is what most people are familiar with as the medications that we use to treat depression as well as anxiety and anxiety disorders such as um, and including OCD. So what we know is that SSRIs are not shown to be effective in the starvation phase of an eating disorder. And why not? And I'll tell you now that this goes over two slides because there's so much data on why it's not effective. And in looking through these data points, it'll make sense why this could apply um, for many different eating disorder distinctions. So SSRIs depend on serotonin being present. Because your brain uses the food that you eat and the vitamins that are available to synthesize or to make serotonin, 
if you're having disruptions in those supplies, your body can't make the serotonin molecule for the medication to act on. I like to think of it kind of like Lego blocks, but that's because I have two young boys and Legos are a daily part of my life. But the, um, the idea that you've got the chemicals from your food that you're eating, the vitamins also from the food that you're eating, and then whatever maybe is your genetic component, all of these things affect whether serotonin and also norepinephrine and dopamine are available in the brain. Tryptophan is the essential amino acid that's found only in dietary sources that is required for serotonin synthesis. In healthy women who have been dieting for as little as one week, plasma tryptophan levels are already at a reduced state. Gonadal steroids, which are steroids released from the ovaries or from the testicles, gonadal steroids are also reduced in the starved state which um, they help modulate serotonin uptake. So if your gonadal steroids are altered, that's another reason why the system uh, may be dysfunctioning. And then uh, CSF, which is brain fluid, CSF concentrations of serotonin are low during underweight anorexia nervosa. And then in this particular study, they were normal in short-term weight restored anorexia nervosa and elevated in long-term weight rest restored anorexia. Additionally, one of those um, vitamins that's very important to the, the building block of uh, proteins in our diet becoming our neurochemicals, folic acid. Folic acid is vitamin B9, and it is required for monoamine synthesis. The mono means serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Dietary folate is found in, for example, leafy vegetables, legumes, fruits, and cereals and breads are fortified with synthetic folic acid. There are several polymorphisms, which are genetic variations, which are present in the general population, which can alter the formation of L-methylfolate, L-methylfolate being very important, as I'll show in a moment, to make the monoamines as well. So a complex system with multiple different reasons why malnutrition or mismatched intake in any of various areas could impact the availability of the monoamines for medications to be effective. Now, this is a busy slide, but everything on this slide is going to be detailed in the slides to come. So folic acid, which is vitamin B9, that folic acid is the synthetic form or the over-the-counter form or what is added to, uh, to foods to, uh, to supplement their nutritional value. So that's folic acid. It transitions in the body through the liver into dietary dihydrofolate which is transitioned further into tetrahydrofolate, which transitions into methylene tetrahydrofolate and then into L-methylfolate. L-methylfolate may trigger your memory um, about things you've seen on TV as commercials or, or read in uh, various studies, as L-methylfolate has become um, a very talked about entity in psychopharmacology for um, over a decade now. L-methylfolate regulates tetrahydrobiopterin, which is also called BH4 much easier. Um, BH4, in the presence of adequate tyrosine and tryptophan, those are your nutritional proteins, in the uh, company of tyrosine and tryptophan, BH4 is a critical factor in allowing your body to make dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the scientific abbreviations, DA is dopamine, NE is norepinephrine, 5-HT is serotonin. I've always seen that 5 as an S, which helps me remember 5-HT serotonin. L-methylfolate also reduces COMT or catechol, <laughs> oh my, catechol O-methyltransferase synthesis. COMT is important because it breaks down dopamine and norepinephrine. So before now, we've talked about all the things that help support the availability of neurochemicals. And because COMT metabolizes or breaks down those neurochemicals, if we can shut down COMT, we'll also have more dopamine and norepinephrine available. And if L-methylfolate is deficient, including for uh, either nutritional or uh, genetic reasons, then the BH4 is reduced, and then that does the opposite action, decreases the monoamine synthesis and increases the, the COMT synthesis, which is going to increase the monoamines uh, disappearing from the brain fluid. About 60% of the general population has at least one genetic mutation or polymorphism in the synthesis of L-methylfolate. Um, and there is a test available for that. And we'll talk more about that as we come to that information. So 
that's the very complicated slide. We've just talked through it. And now we'll go to the, uh, the slides that really, I think, make it make more sense to me um, as they uh, walk us through um, the, the changes. So folic acid is your oral um, synthetic. It's added to, new, uh, to some foods to increase absorptions then dietary hydrofolate, hydrofolate, and then tetrahydrofolate, methylene tetrahydrofolate, and L-methylfolate as you go around that circle in a counterclockwise fashion. MTHFR is right below that orange L-methylfolate molecule, and MTHFR is the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. That's the genetic marker that so many of us um, can now test for and look at to see if the body is able to do this well. If that, uh, if that reductase is um, an area where you have a genetic mutation, however, you cannot make the L-methylfolate nearly as efficiently as a body that has the normal um, genes there. And so if somebody has one gene that is um, not efficient, then you're going to come down in your L-methylfolate production. But if you have two genes that are impacted there, then you're going to have much reduced L-methylfolate. Um, and then that's going to impact your body's ability to take the proteins that you eat and make them into the neurochemicals. So tryptophan hydroxylase is our little enzyme here who is asleep. And if we have BH4 not bound to the tryptophan hydroxylase, it stays unreceptive to um, nutrition uh, entering the cell, tryptophan in this case. So there's our tryptophan molecule. You can see that the opening to receive the tryptophan molecule is not shaped properly. So I can't get in. So we add the BH4, which is going to wake up our enzyme and change its configuration so that now our enzyme can take our tryptophan and make it into serotonin. The same um, idea occurs also with tyrosine. Uh, tyrosine hydroxylase is our little enzyme who's sleeping. The BH4 isn't bound, so the tyrosine molecule cannot get in. But we wake up our enzyme and change its configuration, and it can take in the tyrosine and transition it into dopamine and norepinephrine. Dopamine is the first uh, neurochemical that is produced, and the norepinephrine is uh, a neuro is derived from the dopamine. The dopamine kind of gets clipped an additional time and then it becomes what we call norepinephrine. So these little game of life people um, that are upside down, those are in this particular scenario serotonin molecules. And because we do not have L-methylfolate, we have very few of our serotonin molecules. So even though we've taken our SSRI and turned off the reuptake pump, that's the red circle being the SSRI turning off the blue um, ellipse that is the uh, pump. Even though we've taken it and we've turned that off, we only have a couple of molecules being released because we don't have the building blocks that we need and the process in place to make our serotonin. But if we get our L-methylfolate in place, then we can make a lot more serotonin and it can populate that neuronal junction uh, much more strongly, which makes that SSRI action much stronger as well. And then this is the COMT, that if COMT, uh, I'm sorry, that if L-methylfolate is not available, then the COMT is um, acting uh, with greater action and it will take up the norepinephrine and dopamine, which is this blue marker here. Um, COMT will devour that. But if we have L-methylfolate, it binds up the COMT, and then we have more norepinephrine and dopamine to also be released at the junction. So that is a secondary pathway specific to norepinephrine and dopamine that also enhances the availability of the neurochemical. All right, you held on, I held on, got through it, and um, that is that part of the talk. Now we're going to go on to um, some additional genetic considerations. So historically, we recognize that 
people tolerate medications differently than each other and they also get different benefit from each other and uh, that really complicates the ability to deliver uh, the ideal medication strategy to each individual. That issue of tolerance is whether or not they can take the medication without significant side effects so they can stay on it and efficacy is the benefit. Clinically, we'll have some patients who take the same dose of the same medication and they will get a therapeutic effect, but also maybe have a lot of side effects, even though they're maybe at low doses. Contrarily, there are patients who can take the same medication and go up and up and up on their dose. Um, and maybe as they go up to very high doses, they can get to it and uh, still be tolerating it without very much side effect just two of the possible scenarios. So how can two people respond to a single medication so differently? Well, there are multiple factors that go into that. In what we know um, from previous studies included that people who take antidepressants on average take about two-thirds of their prescribed dose. So they think they're on 100 milligrams of drug, but their blood level is more like they're on 60 milligrams of that drug. And people who are prescribed by psychosis take an even lower um, dose at 58%. And for people who have uh, just a primary physical medical disorder, they take it at a better rate around 76%. One consideration could be that if a patient is purging, they may not be keeping all of their medication. I've definitely experienced before working with a patient and recognizing that they take their medications in the evening, maybe with dinner, but then they go on to purge. And a problem solving strategy there could be to take the medication either first thing in the morning or last thing at night before going to bed when their behaviors have ceased for the day. How do we best evaluate who might need very high dosing um, and, and get the needed therapeutic benefit or when to change meds? That's uh, where we're going next. There's a technique called therapeutic drug monitoring. This is very simple. It's getting a blood level that tells us if the patient um, is holding a serum level of that medication. And for psychiatric meds, partly because with psychiatric meds, there's a higher risk of taking overdose. And if you were in the emergency room, they would need to assess you to see how high is your blood level. Does it reflect that you've taken an overdose? Does it reflect that you've not been taking your medication? Um, so for that reason, we have these therapeutic drug levels affect, um, normalized for almost every psychiatric drug, certainly for most antidepressants, antipsychotic drugs, and mood stabilizers. It does not tell us that the medication is going to be effective for the person who's taking it. What it does tell us is that for the dose that they are taking, are they getting about the dose that most people would have in their blood, or are they having a higher blood level than expected, or a lower blood level than expected? So to work through this with different patient examples, in patient one, they're tolerating their SSRI easily, no side effects, but also no benefit. The uh, prescriber has continued to titrate up to full FDA recommended dosing and only gotten to partial benefit, still no side effects. Treatment options may include switch medications, augment or add a secondary medication, and checked with the patient to make sure their compliance is good because improving the patient compliance may really improve the patient's benefit. I'll briefly say some ways to, trick, uh, to check patient compliance include looking at how often are they filling a 30-day supply of medication. If they're filling it every 40 days or every 45 days, that gives you an easy awareness that they're not filling it as often as they need to be, so they're not taking it. Um, or if they're on autofill, <laughs> that they're getting their medications filled, is to have them check their medication cabinet and see if they've got other partial bottles or if they're um, starting to build up bottles of refills before they're finishing their current medications. Sometimes patients themselves are very surprised. They would tell you they might take it 95% of the time, almost never miss, and then 
in looking at the actual numbers and the prescription dates, they can recognize that they really are missing it more often. And that really is a, a nice area for some problem solving and partnering with your patient. So we've gotten the blood level. First of all, we know they're taking it, and now we've gotten the blood level. So first we wanna review how are they taking it? That was the, the adherence issue. And then two, super therapeutic dosing may become um, rational because if they're taking it consistently and they're tolerating it really well, but their blood level is low, then if you go up to higher doses that are typically um, approved by the FDA, you might target getting to that um, blood level that is associated with the maximum recommended dose of the medication and see if we can get that patient up to an adequate response um, to that medication. If the blood level is normal, then we know that they've got good saturation in the brain at the targets of the current medication, and we might need to move forward to an augmentation strategy. Why not switch um, instead of augmenting or adding another medication? I know I struggle with this myself. I would usually like to switch. Why well, have somebody on two medicines if, uh, or yeah, two medicines if one would do. But if the person is already having a positive response to a single agent, when you switch, you, you stand the chance of losing the current benefit. So evidence-based medicine says you augment, you add a, a well thought out secondary agent rather than switching. So you maintain the current benefit and you add to it. All right, scenario number two. Um, this is a true example. Uh, we had a hospitalized patient with history of treatment non-compliance. She grudgingly accepted an antipsychotic and she did very well on it. Um, her drug levels were obtained while in the hospital with nursing administering and watching the completion of the medication dosing. As she stepped out patient care, she started to struggle very similarly to how she had struggled in her eating disorder previously, similar thought patterns, similar behaviors, but she stated that she was continuing her medications. Blood levels were rechecked and the outpatient level was much lower than the inpatient level, almost non-detectable. So it was very clear that the patient was no longer being compliant with her medications, but also couldn't be honest with her treatment team um, that she wasn't taking it. So without blood testing, we might have said, well, I don't know why that medicine isn't working anymore, but clearly it isn't and we need to switch. Instead, we were able to be very consistent in um, gently therapeutically confronting that patient and having a fact base to support our concerns. And once she was ready to accept medications again, we already knew which medication was helpful and what dose could be helpful, and we could just restart it. Okay. Patient example number three. A patient has had several medication trials without therapeutic benefit. In her course of mental health care, she has learned her depression is, quote, treatment resistant. She has internalized this to mean that future medication trials will not be effective for her either. She also has family history of poor response to psychiatric medications, which increases that belief that she cannot benefit. How do you help this patient re-engage in her treatment? One, taking a really thorough treatment history, her medication trials. Did she stay on them long enough? Does she take them consistently? Did the dosing uh, get to an adequate level? And was she nourished at the time? Discussing the benefit of the antidepressant, um, I think is important as well, helping patients understand why is this supposed to be helpful to them? And one thing that is observed in regard to the medication, the serotonin medications being helpful is that it does help the brain be more plastic. So, if somebody is in an ongoing negative environment, being more plastic isn't especially helpful. But if somebody is doing therapy and they're in a supportive environment and they're changing their behaviors, allowing the brain to be more plastic will help it take in this new scenario and lay down new pathways and uh, do those things uh, better. So therapy and antidepressant medications are highly complementary. Also consider genetic testing. If the person has multiple family histories uh, with poor response or non-response to psychiatric medications, that 
gives you a hint right there. There could be a genetic issue. And then if they themselves have had several um, unsuccessful treatments with medications, so long as those medications were full trials, then um, that gives us another reason to really need to rule this um, potential out or in so that we can address it. So psychogenomic testing may show a rationale for the poor response and help direct therapy with future choices that have a greater evidence base. This can really help the patient who had been feeling hopeless and uh, that further treatment efforts were not gonna be worthwhile. It may help them buy back into their treatment and be an active partner with you in getting their eating disorder and their depression or anxiety treated. All right, but gene testing is not a crystal ball. I will not tell you how long I searched for this image, but I do like it. So I wish it were crystal ball. We're not there yet. In the meantime, um, gene testing is something that is very exciting within psychiatry as well as numerous other fields of medicine. Um, Cancer therapies have become more and more specialized with gene testing to be much more effective and target that one person's illness. We are not there, as I said earlier yet, with psychiatric testing, but there is data that is helpful to utilize in the decision-making of treatment. So the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, published um, a, a consensus paper on April 25th of 2018. Uh, Dr. Nemiroff uh, led that paper and uh, their consensus about whether or not and how to utilize uh, psychogenomic testing said several things. One, it's not a first line strategy. Starting it just, or doing the testing just for any patient who might need to be on a psychiatric medication would not improve the overall statistics of outcome. It might, however, be more beneficial for patients who have failed previous treatments. We have to be careful because the gene testing might be misunderstood or misunderused by patients and or providers. And I've certainly seen that. Um, I'll talk about that more as we come to some of the later examples. Available outcome data is from a biased source. Most outcome data that is um, available regarding these gene tests are coming from the companies themselves. So they clearly have um, an investment in these tests being successful, and they are not run as, uh, as scientifically rigorous studies would be done otherwise. When used cautiously and methodically, data can assist in better selections, and that can help us reduce med trials, reduce side effects, reduce cost, and possibly improve efficacy. And none of it's worthwhile if it's not improving efficacy. The science is getting better. And uh, even in Dr. Nemiroff's opinion, he said it will be even better in five years, and that was April of 2018. So we're getting closer. As an example of a meta-analysis which drove that decision paper um, from the APA, um, I'll let you read this for yourself, but the conclusion was that current analysis looking at numerous previous um, studies by different gene, gene testing companies yields support for an improved response and remission rate in major depressive disorder when treatment is guided by the pharmacogenomics. All right, I also want to address GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. This is a federal law um, which makes it illegal for health insurance companies to discriminate against the patient based on their genetic information. The federal law does not protect against genetic discrimination by life insurance companies, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance companies. And then some states have specific laws in this area, um, which would have to be interpreted in conjunction with the federal law. The reason I bring this up is many patients and providers have wondered if I do the gene testing and they find something that's not favorable in my genetic makeup, will it impact my ability to obtain insurance or will it impact my ability to, um, or the, the cost of the insurance to me? Will the insurance company adjust it based off of uh, my genetic information? And so this is, is the answer to that question. The health insurance company cannot discriminate based on the genetic information, but there may be discrimination risks from the life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance companies. 
Um, so that is an area that um, clearly is in need of more legislation. Okay. How being human impacts the treatment response from a genetic testing position? So genetic testing has the potential of assisting in diagnosing psychiatric illnesses and in selecting the psychiatric drugs. Testing for genetic variations of the liver enzyme system called cytochrome P450 can be obtained and it predicts um, several things, higher or lower values of drugs based off of um, how their body individually processes that drug, upregulating, downregulating in different areas that could cause blood levels to be very different um, even with the same medication in one individual. Combined with therapeutic drug monitoring, which is the blood tests, genotypes, I'm sorry, the, the blood test for plasma levels or serum levels of the medications, the genotypes, the so gene testing, can um, sometimes help explain side effects or lack of therapeutic effects. For example, if my blood test says that somebody's uh, medication level is lower than expected, their gene test may also say that they don't process that medication well. They will, they will have trouble building up sufficient blood levels. And in that case, I would probably want to switch to a different medication for that patient because I know that their genes are going to make this medication less likely to be effective than uh, a sister, baby brother medication. Um, the genetic markers explain greater or lesser likelihood also of response non-response or side effects. So with this information, providers can make a more um, considered uh, option uh, for discussion with the patient. They can use quote, the weight of the evidence uh, to make a more informed treatment decision with the patient. And I also think a lot of patients will feel more positive about the work that they are doing because they know their scientific data behind it. However, it is not an absolute mentioned earlier, there could be um, information that doesn't seem to, to float well between the two different tests. And I'm going to give an example. I had a patient who, um, with her OCD and her eating disorder in combination, very specifically would only accept one SSRI, that specific one. And on the full FDA dose, I'm sorry, that, that um, she'd also had her gene testing done. And on the gene testing, that one medication was shown to be um, normally metabolized. So whatever dose she's taking, she should have the desired blood level. However, because she had such a lack of response to that medication and was still very ill, we did do her blood level and it was significantly lower than expected. So in that case, her gene testing said, use as usual, this medication will be processed normally in this patient, but her actual medication level was much lower than expected. Well, you might say, perhaps she wasn't taking it. Well, this patient was court ordered. She was being observed every day um, with checking precautions for taking that medication. And she did agree to increasing the dose. And as we increased the dose above the FDA uh, recommendations, we did see that her blood level corresponded with the increase. Um, so that suggests that she was taking the medication. And finally, as we got uh, to very high um, SSRI doses, her blood level got to where you would want it to be uh, for somebody taking the usual maximum dosing. And she did uh, develop a, a positive response to the medication. It made a significant difference in her treatment. So the gene testing alone would have guided us down the wrong path, but adding the therapeutic drug monitoring to it allowed us to be more specific to her as an individual. This is just one example uh, or one set of examples of some of the things that gene testing is looking at. You'll notice that MTHFR is there at the bottom and COMT is there. So obviously both of those have something to do with the regulation and availability of um, the serotonin, norepinephrine and dopamine receptors. And then uh, I'll, I'll let you read through the others, but you can see poor response, slow response, poor tolerability, um, more risk of specific side effects. So in some ways, the gene testing can really be very informative. For example, these are some of the major test manufacturers at the time that I made this presentation. Um, 
businesses change. But uh, GeneSight, GenomeMind, and Pathway Genomics um, have some of the uh, more significant data sets about the benefit of their testing. And then there are some pharmacogenomic specialized centers. Um, specifically, the Mayo Clinic has a center for individualized medicine that is focused largely on um, not on psychiatric conditions, but on traditional medical conditions where you go and do some testing to find out what your genetic layout is, and then they do their medication um, treatment for whatever that ill state is more specifically tailored to you. Um, just really in the same way that I'm describing using both the TDM and the uh, genomic testing in psychiatric conditions. For example, of uh, testing, many people are familiar with GeneSight, and I've got some slides in just a moment um, with a, a typical response um, from that testing. But they test for all of these different subgroups. So regarding antidepressant medications, in this particular case, you can see the green column, you know, green means go, uses directed. Then there's the yellow column, use with caution, um, and then the red column, Obviously, they're, they're using common stoplight technology here. You'll see those numbers after each medication on the yellow and red column. Those medications correspond with um, a later uh, piece, which I'll show you, saying what each of these medications are being flagged for. Increased blood level, uh, decreased blood level, increased side effect risk, drug-drug interactions. So for this particular patient, you would ideally want to choose from those um, only the three medications that were listed as, as good for them. However, they may have had positive prior responses to some of these other medications or already beyond some of these other medications and looking further into those uh, specific uh, annotations will help us determine um, how to proceed. Um, mood stabilizers, same idea. Um, opioids, and these are what some of those numbers mean. So um, because this is a sample patient, we don't need to uh, figure out the nuances of each one, but you can see serum levels may be too high, um, so you might want to use a lower dose to be better tolerated. Serum levels may be too low, and we need a higher dose, like my patient who had normal testing but actually um, functioned as a number two there. Difficulty to predict dose adjustments due to conflicting variations in metabolism. So that means they're going two different directions, regard, or at least two different directions regarding how this medication is processed. So it's going to be complex and difficult to um, uh, predict. So you might want to do something else. The genotype may impact drug mechanism of action. So that's interesting. That's not just higher or lower blood level, um, which kind of says, well, what if we just get to the other blood level? If the genotype may impact the drug mechanism of action, then that's a sign that no matter what dose we get to with that medication, it's unlikely um, to give us the effect that we need. Use of this drug may increase risk of side effects. FDA label identifies a potential gene-drug interaction. So these are just some of them. Obviously, the, uh, we're missing five and seven there. But so this is a sample patient, and this is the utility of all those little numbers off to the side. And I've got to get my reading glasses on for these and good strong light because it's all written very small, um, but it's definitely much more useful than just considering medications as those three columns of green, yellow, and red. Um, another format that they give you kind of the same information is giving you the medication with these different uh, cytochrome P450 um, enzymes across the top that could help understand why two medicines going through the same receptor are going to both have too high of a level if you take them together. So that could be a drug-drug interaction based off of a gene consideration. And uh, here it is nicely laid out again which drugs were yellow and which drugs were red within uh, the testing for the sample patient. Um, it breaks it down further and I'll let you read through these as you like, but um, I'll point out that um, on the top right, the higher risk, I, I really appreciated learning this, that they can tell us that this patient is at a higher risk of getting Stevens-Johnson syndrome. That's a very specific medical complication that can be life-threatening. 
having that information could help me make a decision with my patient uh, to help them avoid an unnecessary medical risk. And then pharmacokinetic genes have more to do with the metabolization of the medication. Do they go fast? Do they go slow? And just to add confusion to the mix, extensive metabolization is normal. So there's ultra rapid, extensive, and intermediate. Um, and then there's also slow, uh, poor, there we are, poor metabolizer at the top right. So I'm going to give a, a what I thought was this kind of funny example, but it really did help improve the therapeutic um, options for this patient, is I had a patient come in who told me she had had the gene testing done and regarding her opiate um, narcotic therapy, that she needed a higher than usual dose. And she clarified that she knew she needed that because she was an extensive metabolizer. So it really created a situation where we could talk about extensive meaning normal, um, not extensive as would generally be interpreted. And therefore she only needed the usual dosing um, and, and not needing that higher than normal dosing. And that really allowed us to talk about her psychological as well as physiologic dependence on the opiate medication. Um, here we are, the MTHFR. You can tell uh, that this is a pretty straightforward one. Do you have no genetic variation at this specific site? So that would be green. Do you have one uh, mutation? That would be yellow. Or do you have both um, alleles in that site impacted, in which case that would be red? A patient who is in the red column there almost certainly needs to take an L-methylfolate supplement in order to get the serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine available in their brain for their medications to be effective. A patient in this column would possibly have history of taking multiple medications with very poor response. Um, so this is, this is a really important thing to be aware of. There are some studies saying that just augmenting the L-methylfolate, just giving them the gene or the, um, the transmitter that is just one level past this gene that doesn't work, so it doesn't require the gene to work for you to get that medication in your system, that some people get an antidepressant response just from taking the L-methylfolate, which is a, a supplement, um, because we're normalizing what the body would otherwise be able to metabolize. All right, that came on pretty quickly. Here we are at the end. Um, I would ask you for questions. However, um, what is today? May 12th of 2020? I don't know what day you're watching this. Um, you do have my email address and I'm happy to answer additional questions. I'm going to just briefly show you a three-year-old picture of my two little boys and uh, wish you all well. Thank you.